If you're looking for a troubleshooting guide for Kubernetes, then this episode is for you. Welcome back to the Is It Observable YouTube channel. Today's episode is part of the Kubernetes series where we covered lots of various topics. In today's episode, we walk through the process required to identify an issue related to our application deployed within our Kubernetes cluster. When operating workload in Kubernetes, it clearly happens that we are going to face a couple of issues with our applications due to different reasons. So it could be a workload related issue where our deployments or resources could have an issue. Or it could be a networking issue where our application is not reachable or is not responding. Or worst case scenario, it could be our Kubernetes core components that are having an issue. To diagnose our Kubernetes issues, no surprise, we will look at the states of our objects, the Kubernetes events, the logs, the resource usage. A few months ago, I released an episode sharing the power of the Kubernetes events. And it's true, it's one of the main sources helping us to understand the states of our Kubernetes objects. This episode will follow the similar journey, but we will mainly focus on explaining what we should look at when dealing with an issue in our Kubernetes deployments. If you enjoyed today's content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So let's see what you're going to learn out of this episode. We'll start by looking at the issues related to our Kubernetes workload. Then we will naturally look at the potential issues related to the network. We'll cover the Kubernetes core components and the consequence when one of those components is not running properly. Last, we will look at the observability aspects that we need to detect those issues in our environment. In the Kubernetes world, when deploying workload, we can run into issues that are related to the actual settings defined in our workload definitions. But before going to the troubleshooting journey, let's remember a few Kubernetes concepts. Like explained in the episode related to the power of the Kubernetes events, when deploying workload in our Kubernetes cluster, we will go through specific steps. So let me briefly remind the process. When utilizing a CI CD solutions or simply kubectl, we are technically sending an API request with a JSON payload to our Kubernetes API, asking to deploy some resources. As a simple reminder, all the control plane of Kubernetes is hosted in dedicated nodes, the master nodes, that will host the important components of Kubernetes. So everything starts from the API server that will then forward the request to the control manager that will look at the request and will forward the task to the scheduler. The scheduler, the control manager and etcd will be in charge of turning our manifest files into real Kubernetes objects that are allocated within our nodes. At that state, our workload is in pending states. In these states, the control plane of our Kubernetes is looking for the available node that could host our resources. This is the perfect mission for the Kubernetes scheduler, meaning that our workload could clearly be stuck in that state simply because we have not enough resources left on our nodes for that workload. In fact, when I'm referring to the resources, I'm referring to the definitions that we've defined in the request CPU and request memory defined on our container specification. But also it could be related to the label selector defined in our workload, or if we applied any taints and tolerance that will force the scheduler to look for specific nodes. Maybe in the nodes that have been filtered with the label selector, those nodes doesn't have enough resources left or simply there's no nodes with that label selector. Pending phase is clearly meaning that we are looking for or trying to find the right node to host our workload. The simple way of diagnosis a pod stuck in penny states is to basically look if our pod has a node assigned. If no, it is clearly a sign of an issue to schedule our workload. Once we have a node, the scheduler will reach out to the local kubelet available in the node that will be responsible to any local operations on the node. Kubelet will check that all the potential dependencies for our workload exists. By dependencies, I'm referring to all the external Kubernetes objects used for our workload. So it could be secrets, uh, config map, uh, pers persistent volumes, uh, persistent volume claims, and so on. 
And if they are missing, well, our workload will be stuck again in panic states. So to understand why a pod is not moving to the creating states, even if it has a node assigned, we we'll simply need to describe our pod to get the details. So we will use kubectl describe. If it moves to the creating states, kubectl will pull the image defined in our manifest. If the image is wrong or not accessible, we will again get a Kubernetes error. So the image pullback error. Our pod will be stuck in the creating state. Our pod could have one or several containers. It, we could also have an init container that we have manually defined or that we have injected through a Kubernetes operator. If the init container task is never ending its tasks, our pod will stack in a creating states, in fact, in the init phase. All the containers running in our pods will have an exit code and a reason. We can easily retrieve this information using kubectl get pod and try to get the YAML format. There are several type of exit code. So here is the list of the exit code. At the end, all the error code greater than 100 shows an issue to the container runtimes of a cluster, or it could be OM killed, or simply the container runtime has trouble to run the command that we defined in our Docker file. So if your pod is stuck in a creating states, describing or getting the details from the Kubernetes object stored in a Kubernetes API will help us to understand what is really happened during the deployment flow. Once our pod has been successfully created, we should have an IP allocated and details on which node our pod is currently running. Next, in our pod, we can define readiness probes and health probes. Those would be a crucial settings that Kubelet will use to understand if our workload is ready to serve traffic or it is actually healthy. That is the reason we need to make sure that those probes are well configured to avoid side effects from Kubelet. For example, if our health probe is failing and we have defined a restart policy to always, then kubelet will restart our pod because of the behavior of the health probe. So health probe is an amazing feature, but if not well configured, then it almost like a disadvantage. So if you see that your workload is unhealthy or keep restarting, well, that could be clearly a sign of an issue with your readiness probe. Last, if our application is crashing to an application error, then it will raise a crash loop back off after several restarts. We will have to look at the logs, uh, the traces, the events, anything helping us to troubleshoot our application error. It could be also an issue in the config of our application or a security policy applied that breaks our applications. If a global policy has been applied and has rejected our workload, then usually we're getting a Kubernetes event helping us to understand that the reasons of why this workload has been denied. From this process, troubleshooting our workload requires to have specific observed details. As you can see, based on the states, uh, the event produced by Kubernetes, it basically drives our analysis or observability tools to understand what is currently the root cause to our problem. By the way, if you pay attention, the collector has a receiver called Kubernetes objects that will exactly share all the details of the objects that is stored in the Kubernetes API. Then it could also be related to the node, the node health. I mean, if we are not able to schedule our workload on a node, then it probably means that our current node doesn't have the right resources to allocate our workload. So having the node usage and the details on the request definitions of our workload could be a crucial information to troubleshoot. Last, if you are facing an application issue, then the logs become our best friend. So collecting logs would be our life jacket to guide our actions. When deploying applications in our cluster, we will probably add a Kubernetes service to manage the networking within our cluster. And if we need to expose it out of the cluster, we're probably gonna use an ingress rule or HTTP route or gRPC route with the gateway API. When misconfiguring our networking aspects, we could also run into issues. What could go wrong in the networking? Well, usually it's about defining the right sets of ports that will be used by the service 
and how it will link it to our pod. Remember, your service will technically act like a load balancer with the various replica of our workload. A given service can expose several ports, and of course, the port of the service could be different from the one defined in our pod definition. What is the common mistakes with services? Well, like I said, a service will link pods that are respecting the label sector. So if you are modifying your labels on your workload definitions, then the networking rule may not match anymore. So the selector defined in our services is not working anymore. Every time we deploy a service, Kubernetes is creating a Kubernetes endpoint. The endpoint is the object that links the IP of the pod matching to our label selector to the IP of our service. So if we have a doubt on the way our pods are linked to our service, we can simply look at the IP of the pods and make sure those IP are listed in the endpoint. The other thing with the services is the type. For some obscure reasons, few projects defines a node port services that will be allocating a port on a node. As you can expect, the number of ports on a given host is limited. So if all the services are defined that way, well, you could reach that limit one day. Before starting to investigate our network issue, try if possible to do a port forward on your pod and then on the service as well to make sure that both of them are responding and is not having, let's say, an HTTP 404 error. Like explained in the episode related to Cilium, the DNS resolution of our pod services is possible with endpoints, but also with kube proxy. On each node, you have kube proxy or core DNS that is actually running. The DNS will map the service name to the IP of the services that we have just creating using an IP table rule. Remember that we will have one IP address for our service name, and the name of the pod that will be stored as an IP table rule on each individual node. So if you have a large cluster with lots of services, we would have a lots of IT bill IP table rules on each individual node. If our pod and services are responding, then we can start to ask ourselves, do we have any network policy in place that could basically block all incoming traffic or outgoing traffic to our service. Looking at the event and logs from our application container will help us to understand if our application has an issue to reach a given endpoint. If no network policy in place, then we can investigate if any routes has been defined with HTTP routes or gRPC routes, or even uh, in the case of a service mesh, it could be a destination rule or a virtual services. Those rules will match a specific API call or endpoints to an existing route to forward the traffic to our services. If the route is not properly defined, well, the resolutions of the services is not done properly. If you're using a service mesh, you may also use rules like a rate limit or a circuit breaker that could also block for some reason our traffic. But the great news with service mesh is that it's gonna produce lots of logs it will report the service that has been rate limited or that has been basically blocked for some reason. So that is the reason you want to collect the logs produced by the sidecar container in case of Istio, and also to configure properly the service to help the service mesh to identify properly the type of protocol used by the applications. In fact, the app protocol on the service definition is the property that is helping the service mesh to identify the protocol. So what do we need to configure that? Well, the log produced will be different based on the protocol. So you clearly want to have an HTTP access log if you're using HTTP or gRPC. The other thing that we need to pay attention to when we have a network issue is basically to ask yourself, is all the components required for the network running properly? So if you are using, for example, an ingress controller, make sure that the ingress controller pod has not crashed or simply facing some heavy throttling that could be at the end slowing down all the threads of the ingress controller. Of course, this is also true with the sidecar container used by our service mesh. So in the network aspects, always start to collect the IP of your pod, the services, uh, and then check if those endpoints rules has been properly configured. So the IP of the pods and the IP of services corresponds. Try to use port forward on the pod and then on the service. It will just help us to identify if the issue is related to our service definitions or to something else. 
check the logs or events to identify if the traffic has been denied or if a network policy has blocked the traffic or even a service mesh rule is basically limiting the traffic to our pod. Make sure that all the components of our Kubernetes network are healthy. The ingress pod, the sidecar proxy container of a service mesh. And so what could go wrong with Kubernetes? Well, first, our API server. If it's saturated, then all the components interacting with it would be slowed down, meaning that our deployment requests will never be treated. Uh, the operator rules, or application that requires access to specific components through the Kubernetes API, it will probably have errors. Next, we could have an issue with etcd that could be unhealthy. It will be the worst case scenario because etcd is the most critical component. Kubernetes is storing all the status of our Kubernetes objects, so if it's not running, then nothing will work in our cluster. Remember, the API server relies on Etsy. The other crucial components is Kubelet, which is the engines of Kubernetes on our node, helping us to allocate resources for our pod, uh, checking the status of our workload by interacting with uh, the probes. So if Kubelet is not running anymore, then that could also explain why our, why our pods are not being scheduled on a particular node. Anyway, if Kubelet dies, then technically our node will become not ready anymore. So we usually are quickly aware of these situations. And last, we have kubeproxy used for our DNS resolution. If kubeproxy dies or restart, then we may face a network glitch to reach the service deployed on a particular node. Anyway, if kubeproxy dies, then we should be alerted because it's one of the node conditions for our node. That is the reason it is crucial to report a couple of KPI on our core component objects of our master nodes, but also on kubelet and kubeproxy. If you're running in a managed Kubernetes environment using JKE, AKS, EKS, or others, we usually don't have access to our master nodes. But the good news, the Kubernetes API, kubelet, and kubeproxy are producing Prometheus metrics. So we could easily retrieve the data by using the following scrap config. Kubelet and kubeproxy both are producing logs in journal D. To collect the logs of those components, you could use the journal D receiver in the collector, but it requires to have journal D installed on the node. So in a managed environment, I guess we could forget about that option. Most of the observed backends of the market, so Danatrace, Neuralic, and many others, are usually collecting data exposed by the Kubernetes API to get the inventory of the objects, our nodes, our, the CPU, the memory usage of our pods, and the nodes. By getting the details objects, we usually get the status, the phase, the conditions of the nodes, and also the objects. Again, this condition will be reported by the solution to drive the analysis of our given problem. If you're using OpenTemperature Collector, you will need two distinct receivers, so the Kubernetes cluster receiver, giving you a high level details on the cluster, the usage and so on. And there is the Kubernetes object that will send all the, basically the details of, the, of all the objects in a JSON format stored in etcd. In Kubelet, we usually have uh, the C advisor metrics reporting the container usage of our pods. C advisor is the best source of data on the memory usage, uh, the CPU usage, and so on. Because at the end, it will help us to understand if we have any throttling situations. Last is the events and the logs of our workload. The events is driving our troubleshooting experience and logs it will help us to understand the application issue that could be responsible to our issue. So by collecting the inventory, uh, the usage, uh, the logs, we can get a, a clear understanding on the given situation without having the need to run common line like kubectl. If your object solutions offer automation, we can imagine a sort of work automated workflow that will alert uh, the right team in charge of a given workload. Uh, so we could trigger this a workflow based on specific Kubernetes events. In my case, I have generated a workflow in Dynatrace that will be triggered on Kubernetes events that are only related at the moment by through the workload. So I'm intentionally excluding the namespace events, the cluster events, and the node events.
From those events, I'm rich, enriching the events with details like the team in charge of this workload, uh, the number of issues raised on the same times in the, the last minutes. Then I parse that data to have different logic depending on the type of event. So we'll have a back off uh, process, meaning that it could be either the application crash or simply related to an unhealthy probe because if it's been restarted several times, we'll have a crash loop back off. It could be also an unhealthy workload. So I will separate the data for the un uh, unhealthy workload that will in fact be used with a list of back off uh, workload. The, and then we'll have some data for the scheduling issue that will allow me to later to collect requests, uh, memory information on the node scheduled. And if I have a node or not, the generate message will be of course different. So if no node, then probably there's an issue to, of resources or label selector. And then all the other type of issues. It could be related to uh, image pool backoff and other, other stuff. So I will basically treat them uh, differently. I will simply send the message to the team with the message of the event. The intention here of this automated workflow is to send a message to the right team uh, with a pre-analysis of the issue. So then they will be more efficient. So if there is a crash loop back off, we will display the log seen during uh, the detection of the event. Uh, if it's related to an unhealthy workload, I will just precise the health probe defined that is not properly defined. We can even go further by checking the traces from the health check, of course, if we are storing those traces to highlight that the health check issue is failing due to a specific span. I have not completely finished the workflow while recording this video, but don't worry, this episode has usual as a dedicated GitHub repo with all the assets required, and especially you will find the finalized workflow and also a couple of specific dashboards. So we'll have a Kube proxy dashboard, uh, the API server, a Kubelet and more. So that's it for today's episode related to the troubleshooting guide for Kubernetes. As you can see here, we usually start by looking at the workload, uh, workload to look at the pods, if they're running or not, the state of them, uh, if everything has been scheduled and all the required things are there, then it may be an application issue so we can check the logs or the traces to troubleshoot that problem. If it's healthy, everything is healthy but you don't have any answer, it is maybe a networking issue. So again, check if uh, all the network route has been defined, that all the networking components are running, so Qproxy, the service mesh, and others. And of course, if those are running, then it could be a Kubernetes problem. And those Kubernetes problems, usually, don't worry, you should be alerted by the observer backend of your choice uh, because those are looking at the node conditions on our node and are those core components. So there's several ways of collecting that data using different solutions. If you're using the collector, as I, as I mentioned, there is several receivers that could help us to do that. But again, if you're using an existing observer backend solution, they may have already ingested the proper data. So it's just a matter of um, working through the screens. And again, the screens is great, but if you have the automation in place, then you're saving a lot of time. All right, so if you enjoyed today's content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So see you soon for another episode.